everybody. Welcome to our Lunch and Learn today. I am really excited to talk about our awesome topic today. It is how to mentor when you feel like you don't have all of the answers. Our guest today is Kelly Charles Collins. And really, when it comes to this topic, we're talking about when you're paired with another executive for a mentoring relationship, someone that might be in a different industry as you, or somebody that might be at a different stage in their career as you, um, you may feel like you don't have all the answers to what they're going through or that they may not be able to give you the answers that you may be looking for. And so really, this conversation is all about how to overcome that bias and how can we create meaning and value from these relationships even when we don't know all of the answers. So Kelly is our guest today. Kelly empowers smart organizations to stay on the right side of the next hashtag movement. Kelly has the unique ability of making complicated, difficult, and sensitive topics approachable. She's the founder of HR Legally Speaking and has been a lawyer for over 20 years. Kelly, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. So we're talking about mentoring relationships and how can we, how can we overcome our own potential negative thoughts about whether or not we can have the answers to people's advice. So I guess maybe the first question I'd love to ask for you is, are people typically looking for answers? They're not always looking for answers, right? People sometimes just want to be heard or they want to work through whatever's in their brain so that they get it out. So oftentimes when we're in these relationships, we think that our job, especially if we're the mentor, that our job is to answer questions, to just be there as, you know, the encyclopedia to give whatever knowledge is in our brain. However, sometimes we just need to be a sounding board. Because people need to get out what's in their brain to make sure that it sounds a certain way or, you know what, today I just need to vent. Today I just need to get something off my chest. So it's important when we're having these conversations to listen so that you know, okay, am I listening because is, is, are we having this conversation because somebody needs an answer or are we having this conversation now because somebody just needs someone to listen? That's a great point. I think as a lot of executives, I know, I know in our executive mentor programs, one of the best pieces of feedback that I'm hearing is that the, the, the relatability is so critical. It's, it's sometimes not that they've got the answers to your questions. Maybe they're in a totally different industry or they're going through something that you've never gone through before. But to have someone that can relate, that can listen to what you're saying and say, you know what, I've been through maybe something similar, something not so similar, but I, this is how I would handle it, or even not only this is how I would handle it, but have you considered handling it something like this, as opposed to going with the shoulds or going with the asking of the questions? And I think that's a really good point there, Kelly. But let's talk about that for a minute. How can we go about giving advice intentionally without potentially, how can we go about giving advice so then it allows other people to feel like the ideas that we're providing are their own? So I think one of the things you have to do is to not to not do the shoulds. We do that with our kids all the time. You should do this or you got to do this. And what we have to start thinking about is asking people questions. So when even though we might say, well, you should do this or, you know, when I was in your shoes or if I was in your shoes, I would do this. Instead, asking them, have you considered doing this? How would it impact you if you made this decision as opposed to this, or if you took this step as opposed to that step? And start to get them to process the information. Because the thing about empowering people is you give them the power to choose, the power to make decisions. That's where empowerment comes in. It's not from me dumping what's in my head into their head, because that, that doesn't help them. It's still my information they still may not even know how to really process or apply the information that I'm giving to them. So asking them questions where they can then put themselves or their situation into whatever it is I'm suggesting or saying to them will empower them to be able to make the decisions for their particular situation. That's a really, really great point. I think for the executives watching this right now, this can be a, be a, be a point applied not only to their mentoring relationship, but a lot of their working relationships. I think oftentimes we think to ourselves, I'm the executive. I've earned this role. I've gotten to this position in my life because I've worked hard or because I've accomplished or learned all of these things. And that can occasionally, especially if it impacts our ego, potentially close our minds off from giving 
from having an open dialogue with people who are poor to us and being open to learning what they have to say or open to understanding what situations they're going through. I actually, I spoke with someone earlier today was, that was telling me that one of their biggest frustrations with previous experiences in mentorship was that if they were the quote unquote mentee, that it, it, anytime that they were in this type of mentor relationship at a company, that it was almost like a, a loose training session where <laughs> somebody comes up and says, hey, this is how we've done it at our company for X, Y, Z years, and this is how you're supposed to do it, and this is how you should be doing it. And it completely stifles innovation because it doesn't allow for these new people to utilize what they've learned in their experiences and in their past to say, hey, I've done it like this before, and it's been really effective. It might be a great way to do it here. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Um, so with that said, I think for an executive, the idea of can we listen first and can we ask questions to seek to understand deeper is so critical. Um, yeah. I think it's also important to, to realize that these relationships are about sharing. And just as we as experienced people and whatever, you know, whatever um, profession we've been in. So I've been a lawyer for over 20 years and then have recently transitioned into professional speaking. Now, as a lawyer, obviously, I speak all day, right? I've spoken in front of uh, juries and judges and I've taught and I've done all those things. But then I transitioned into this business of professional speaking and I have mentors right in this space because there are things that i know about my skill set but i don't know necessarily about the business of speaking and how to you know navigate those waters and so you know there are things that my mentor can teach me there are things that i can teach her and so these relationships need to be based on mutual respect and sharing and understanding that we all come to this from a different place, but it doesn't mean that you are better than me or because you have title of, you know, CEO or executive or HR. Um, and I may not be at that same level or I could be at that same level, but in a smaller organization, it doesn't mean that I, I have any less knowledge. Um, and so I think if we come to these situ, come to these relationships, with one of respect and an intention to to learn and to share, um, I think that it will work out well. I think a big underlying theme I'm taking from what you're saying is vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Coming in with this idea of mutual respect and openness to sharing what is going on because ultimately, uh, what I've observed often, especially with executives, is when you ask them what's their biggest challenge, sometimes, what they'll say is like the on the surface challenge, but there's really something operating underneath that's the cause of it. And sometimes they might not even be consciously, consciously aware that that is the actual problem that is kind of holding them back. And so they say, my big problem is that I, <laughs> it, it's, typically it's got to do with some form of not having resources. <laughs> so I, I just don't have this resource. I don't have this funding. I don't have this deal yet. I don't have this this approval to do X, Y, Z thing. I don't have this, this, or this. And uh, oftentimes, and I, this is me, you know, <laughs> channeling my inner Tony Robbins, but as Tony Robbins says, there's no lack of resources, just a lack of resourcefulness. Um, are there ways that you can go about identifying solutions and, and coming up with solutions to those problems? So this is a long way of saying, how can we go about asking the questions that kind of dig deeper into those underlying issues that we might, that we as executives, as executives, as leaders might not be fully consciously aware of that are, are inhibiting our ability to overcome this issue. So there's two things. One is, so my coach always has taught me to ask the next, next best question. And then my TEDx coach, she um, put me through that, that why exercise, you know, where you ask, well, why? Okay, well, why? And well, why? So for example, if someone says to you, well, I can't do that because I can't get the approval, right? I, I just can't get this approved. Well, why can't you get it approved? And so they'll tell you, well, I can't get it approved because, you know, my manager is, is just not listening to me or, or, you know, whoever, not listening to me. Okay, well, why aren't they listening to you? Right, so to keep asking, like to make them keep going through the process instead of staying up here, like we're going to go, we're going to keep going like granular, like, okay, why? It's like kids, right? You're kid, well, why? But why? But why? And eventually, because I don't want you to do it, right? <laughs> and that's really the reason, right? Why can't, mom, I want a cookie. No, why? 
because it's too much sugar. No, at, at the end of the day, because I don't want you to have the cookie, right? And if you keep asking me why, eventually I'll get there because I just have run out of options except to get to the root of what the, the problem is. And so asking the next best question and the, best, the next best question might just be why? Yeah. No, I love that, that walking through the, uh, the five whys that kind of get down to the root of an issue um man, that's so interesting i'd love to to dive deeper into that i think sometimes sometimes as a leader we get to that why and then it's something that we don't necessarily like i know one of our meeting agendas um for our mentor meetings is about obstacles both real and perceived how can we distinguish between what are real obstacles and what are perceived obstacles that are holding us back because of fear how can we go about kind of like parsing those two out and not feeling judged or like a, a knock on our ego because of it. Well, I think in asking those questions, you'll figure that out, right? Because um, when people keep asking you why and you have to start answering, then you find out that I'm just really making that up, <laughs> right? All of a sudden you're just like, yeah, why? Right? So you start, now they're asking you why, but in having to respond, you're starting to ask yourself, yeah, why, right? Is this something that I made up or is this really something factual and this is something that I can objectively say is happening? So a lot of times when we have goals or we want to do things, we put up our own roadblocks and then we say, oh, well, we can't accomplish that. Biggest one, I don't have time, right? We're always talking about we don't have time. We make time for the things that we want to make time for. So many times, <laughs> time is just a perceived roadblock, right? And if I start to ask you questions about, well, how, why don't you have time? You know, tell me what you do throughout the day. Tell me, you know, what you do from 9 to 11 and then from 12 to 1. And tell me, tell me what your day looks like. And then all of a sudden you figure out that, you know, I, I spend from 12 to 2 just like, milling around or on social media or doing whatever. And so you find out that, no, that's just the perception that I don't have time, right? And so again, it's about asking those, those probing questions so that people have to really analyze what it is that they're saying to you. And again, for you not, for me not to say, well, we all have the same amount of time in a day. We all have 24 hours in a day. So, you know, why don't you have time? No, let them figure out why in those 24 hours they don't have time. And if they walk themselves through it, then it becomes an epiphany to them. And they say, oh, okay, now I get it. And I haven't told them, well, the reason you don't have time is because you're a slacker. They figure that out on their own, right? Um, and, and again, it's about the empowerment of making those um, decisions and also coming to those realizations. That's a good, good way of putting it because no one wants to feel like they're a slacker or that they were lazy or that they didn't exhaust all of the resources that they could have done. Like so often we think, oh, I couldn't get that approval. Yes. Why? Well, because the, the person it's on their docket, but they've got a lot of other things. Well, have you considered going into their <laughs> office and like going right to that person's desk and asking them to do that? Well, no, I don't want to disturb their day. Why don't you want to disturb their day? well, you know, I don't really have the time to go to their office. It's like, is it that important to you? It's like, well, yeah. Well, then why don't you go to their office if it's that important to you? It's like, well, I don't feel comfortable with putting myself out there for the potential embarrassment of them telling me no. And then you get to the root of everything. It's like, oh, I am got some stuff in my head that's holding me back. And in reality, it's if it's that important, you don't really think about the embarrassment. You just go ahead and do it. Right. Um, and once you get there, and once you get there, sorry, there, once you get there to, I feel embarrassed, um, you know, I don't want to be embarrassed. Okay, let's work through that. Like, why would you want, why would you be embarrassed? Like, what would, what's the worst thing that could happen, right? Right now, as far as you don't have the approval, so the worst thing that could happen is that you still don't have the approval. <laughs> the best thing that could happen is that you walk your butt in there and you get the approval, right? So, you know, that's why I think it's so important to, ask questions and not be focused on, okay, a structure of, oh, I'm going to ask these five questions, right? So why? Yes. But why, why is an open-ended question? Why gets people to, 
to explain and elaborate. And then you can then go into that response and figure out other questions that need to be asked and to help them. Again, it's all about helping pe people make their own decisions and come to their own realizations because then they will feel good about that and they will, they will stick to those, to those decisions or at least know that, okay, I'm not doing it because somebody told me that this is how they do it or this is their way. Yeah, that's great. Let's transition a bit. How can we overcome this fear that we're not qualified? How can we mm -hmm. overcome this fear that we're not qualified to give advice? I know, especially in these executive mentoring relationships where we're pairing people from different companies, leaders from different companies together. Maybe they're in different industries. Maybe they're different sizes of companies. Um, and we might think to ourselves, well, I don't know how the heck I could possibly give somebody this advice. Like they have got so much more experience than me or they, they manage a company that's way larger than mine or they're in the specific niche that I just don't know anything about. How can we overcome this fear that we're not qualified? So one thing that I know and that I try to get people to affirm for themselves is that I belong everywhere that I am. And so if someone has decided that they think that I should be paired with this person, it's for some reason, or I should be in a room, it's for some reason. Or if I'm in the room, I, I know I'm supposed to be there, right? And so I had a coach many years ago. I always have coaches. <laughs> um, I had a coach many years ago, and she had me do an audit of myself. And she said, just sit down and write out the things that you've accomplished in life. She's like, I don't care how small or how big. And so if you find yourself in a situation where you're thinking, mm, I don't know how I match up against this person, or I don't know what I have to give. And that's, that's because we walk, go through life often not thinking about the things that we've accomplished and not giving ourselves credit for the things that we've accomplished. So sometimes we think we're there for luck. But if you're an executive, and you're an executive of a company that has, you know, 100,000 employees, or you're an executive of a company that has 50,000 employees, you're an executive, right? You got there based on, hopefully you got there based on your skill and your education. It may just be, you know, relationships, whatever it is, something brought you to that table. And it might not be the exact same thing that brought that other CEO. But again, when you get into the room, knowing exactly who you are and not fighting this feeling like I have to be as good as or better than. No, I belong here. So it doesn't matter. Like to me, it doesn't matter what skills and, you know, degrees and, and titles that you have. I belong here. So as far as I'm concerned, what are we talking about? <laughs> right? What's on the agenda? How can we help each other? How can we grow? How can we move forward? It doesn't matter to me that, you know, you, you run a bigger company. Now, you may be able to um, impart to me some things that you use in your bigger company that I could scale down to my company, or I may have some processes or things that I've done in my smaller company that I could say, listen, you're really wasting, you know, resources or you ever thought about doing it this way because, you know, blah, blah, blah. Whatever it is, just think about what your skill set is. Just focus on you, focus on your skill set, focus on being confident in who you are. And sometimes it just takes taking that inventory because we forget as we go through life, we forget all of the things that we've, that we've done that make us the amazing people that we are. And we just have to be reminded. So, um, you know, just know that you belong there. Two things on that. One, I love that. I think it goes back to the first or one of the early points we made in this Lunch and Learn, which was about this point that people aren't always necessarily looking for the answers. They're looking for great questions that kind of help pull the answers out of them. Most people know the answers to their own problems uh, because they're the ones that are going to have to take the action. And so in their mind, can they justify which actions are reasonable or unreasonable for them to take? Typically, it's something that's got to be pulled out of them, not something that's suggested to them from somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, so asking the questions is, is critical. But the other big thing that you talked about was this idea of affirmation and just affirming that people deserve to be here and that they're doing a good job and they're being beneficial. It makes me, it makes me think of my business partner, Dave Criswell. And Dave and I met on the tennis courts. Dave has been in business. He's been in sales, um, selling. He's been in software since the 90s. He's been doing this for a very long time. But we met on the tennis court, and one of the things 
that's unique about Dave because when it comes to tennis, especially in doubles, Dave rarely loses. Now, Dave is not this incredible, you know, necessarily tennis player. He's, he's good. Um, he, you know, he's not the fastest guy in the world. He's in his mid fifties. Um, he doesn't have a powerful serve or powerful strokes. He's not going to blaze it by you, but he rarely loses. And the reason why he rarely loses is because he's incredible at giving affirmation to the people he plays doubles with. When I play with him, we rarely lose. Even when we're playing against like, you know, guys who played in college and they're incredible and, and skill wise, they're way better than us. But what Dave does is his affirmation it comes from a place that's just experienced enough for you to, for me to know, like, okay, wow. When he gives me a word of affirmation, like I know he's really saying something to me. He really means this and it's so helpful and it builds me up. And so when you're in this executive mentoring relationship, when you're, when you're in a mentoring relationship with another leader like yourself, if you can take the time to give that affirmation based on your area of expertise, that can be the boost that the other person needs to really motivate them. Because even in our business, Dave doesn't necessarily put in a ton of hours, but when we have our meetings, he does a great job of reaffirming the things that I'm doing and helping guide me into the direction that we should be going. And that invigorates me for every single week. And so the point is this, when you're in a mentoring relationship with another leader, another business leader, if you can derive and, when, and if you can give that form of affirmation to let them know that they're doing an awesome job and that what they've overcome is really difficult and that what they're going through is not easy, but the fact that they made this much progress is really meaningful, it, it inspires people, makes them feel good. It makes them feel accepted. And that is so critical in a mentoring relationship. And I love that you, you touch on that, Kelly. Yeah. Words have power, <laughs> right? Words. Words matter. And people want to know that they're doing a good job. People want to know that other people are paying attention to what they're doing. Um, and so, you know, <clears throat> take the time to just say that to someone, right? It doesn't cost you anything to say, you know what, you got this, or good job, or that was really, you know, I never thought about that. That was really, really well thought out. You know, those types of things that cost us nothing mean so much to somebody else. And so we should really, you know, take the time to come out of our ourselves sometimes and really think about other people and just how that one thing could completely change the trajectory of, of their day or their life. Yeah. I think the one I love from Dave the most is the think about where you were one month ago or two months ago or one year ago, or think about where you were three months ago. We're light years beyond that. We are on a blazing path and we are going somewhere. This is, this is awesome. I mean, think about it. Like the progress we made based on what we thought we were doing or what we thought we would be doing one or two months ago versus what we're doing right now. Seriously, that's not, that's not anything to, uh, to sneeze at. He, you know, that's, we're doing something cool here. And when Dave tells me that, it really, like, that's one of my favorite ways that he, uh, he builds me up. And, um, yeah, I think for our leaders that are watching this right now, when they're thinking about their mentoring relationships and probably even their business relationships, mm -hmm. take a moment to affirm your people. That is something that I could, could really pay some massive dividends, not only for your mentor relationship, but your, for your business relationship and your company culture. Because even if it's someone that's at a higher level than you, and you may think to yourself, well, they know that they're doing a great job. Letting them know really, really makes them feel good. And especially if it's a meaningful, if, if you've listened to what they've been working towards and listened to the things that are going on in their world, and you acknowledge how difficult it is to get there, your bit of expertise in trying to do make change happen in your business world as well gives them the context to make them feel like wow this is coming from an authentic place this is this is legit yeah and i think also in affirmation we have to understand how people receive affirmations right so some of us um words words are really important so if i you know someone says oh you got this or you've done well or whatever for me that's wonderful some people words won't do it so we have to think of uh, did someone tell you that they wanted to, um, you know, they wanted to create something and then you put it in writing or you, you let everybody know that it's happened or something. Think of how, and, and this comes from listening, right? In those relationships, what is it that, that you've learned from that person that 
you know that, okay, that makes them feel good or they have felt heard. What is it? Is it, uh, is it me affirming you in words? Is it me, you know, applauding you in front of everyone? Is it, you know, is it that? Is it acknowledging you by giving you something? Um, you know, so if I, if I'm writing a book and I tell you that my favorite author is blah, blah, or, you know, I'm doing something, you know, maybe purchasing that book, right, for them. Um, again, that is a way of affirming who they are and what they're doing. And so, um, just don't, don't limit it to words. Try to understand in that relationship. It's the love languages, right? <laughs> it's really the love languages for work and figuring out what that, what that language of appreciation or acknowledgement is for them and, um, and using that to really, um, bolster the relationship. I love that. That makes a lot of sense because affirmation is not a one size fits all solution. So let's transition a little bit more of it. Um, how can we overcome biases? We talked to, we touched on it just momentarily at the very beginning. I want to come back to that biases in a mentoring relationship. And by that, I just mean, I might come into a mentoring relationship and think to myself, well, I don't know how the heck I could possibly learn from this other leader you know, she's in a different company as me. She's in a, di a different industry, different size of company. I don't know how I could possibly give insight to her. I don't know how she could possibly give insight to me. How can I overcome this bias? So the first, the first step is acknowledging that you have the bias, so being aware of it. Um, and so if you're aware that you even have those questions or those thoughts, that's the first step. So our biases come from, unconscious bias comes from things that we've heard, read, seen, or experienced. And as we go through life and as we've gone through our careers, it's, it's ingrained in us in some way to think that if somebody has a particular title or if they work at a particular company or size of company that somehow they are better than or they know more than, right? Which is not necessarily true. So first you need to become aware that you have those thoughts, those stereotypes and that you're categorizing people in that way. The second thing is to have the courage to be able to question yourself about that and say, why do I have those thoughts? You know, why, why, why would I think that that person is better than me? And then you have to be willing to then change, right? So if you have that thought about that person, you have to be willing once you question yourself to change your thought process about that. Um, and so, you know, in that, in disrupting that thought pattern. So we have thought patterns and we have stereotypes about people. And in order to overcome bias, we have to be willing to disrupt and then we have to disrupt. So, you know, it goes from awareness to action. And that's how you, that's how you effectively disrupt unconscious bias. And also knowing that every single day, every single minute, we get more and more information. And so we'll continue to have these biases. But biases are learned so they can be unlearned. And so it's a, it's a continuous job of disrupting. But if you um, are up to the task and you continue to work on that, eventually you'll get to a point where you'll have more discernment and you'll understand when things are coming to you to be able to check yourself, to be able to stop yourself in, the, in your tracks or stop other people to say, you know, to go back and question like, well, where did you get that information or why do you think that? And then be able to disrupt it. And how can we call out bias? Like if we hear something from somebody, I know I, I hear this sometimes, um, let's say an executive, I had an executive that came to me one time and he said, well, hey, you know, I noticed, um, I just looked up my mentor on LinkedIn and I noticed that he, you know, is, is not running a business as big as mine, like, or it's not in the same industry as mine. Uh, you know, are you sure? Can I, uh, how can I know that I'm going to get some value out of this relationship? He's already coming in pessimistic and he's already coming in with like, it's already an uphill battle. He's already coming in with this mindset like, I don't think I could get any value out of this person because this person works in a different industry than me or this person doesn't run a company as big as mine. How can we overcome that? By, or rather, how can we call out that bias when we hear someone else saying negative things or pessimistic things about coming into something new? And by the way, I think this can apply to a lot of these leaders. They manage people. And mm -hmm. if they have to change tasks for their people, I would imagine that sometimes people don't meet change with the most embracing arms there <laughs> of that they might be pessimistic about this new change how can we 
call out bias without challenging somebody's ego, frustrating somebody, or yeah, just essentially putting it in a way so that they can think about it and realize, you know what, I do have bias and this is not serving me in this moment. Yeah. So for example, if they were thinking, you know, how am I going to learn anything or ask them, what if you did learn something? How would that impact you? Right. Why ask them, why do you think that somebody in a smaller company could not teach you something because you work for a bigger company or vice versa? Right. What is that block for you? Um, What is it about the size of the companies that you think, you know, would cause their knowledge base to be any less than yours? Or what if, how about, what if they did something in their industry that you could then um, use in yours and become the leader or a trailblazer? You know, how would that make you feel? And so really, again, going back to the whole thing about asking the next best question and really getting people to think through why they have these thoughts. Like, why do you have these negative um, impressions? What about this? Like, what is stopping you? Is this something that you just don't really want to do? Or perhaps it might be that they're not even worried about what that other person knows. So if I'm in a bigger company, I'm an executive in a bigger company, and I'm matched with an executive in a smaller company, maybe I'm afraid of what I don't know, right? And so maybe I'm afraid of showing up in this relationship and thinking, well, they may think that I should know all of this, or I might, you know, I'm all of this because I'm in this company. And meanwhile, here I am thinking, well, I don't really know all that stuff. So it might not even be about the other person. It might just be about yourself. Great point. And often it is. Often mm-hmm. it's about the other person. It's about our own biases in our mind about, yeah, our, our own, yeah, our, essentially our own unconscious biases that we need to overcome. And it's difficult to overcome that because we have to unteach ourselves, just like you had said. Kelly, this has been valuable. This has been great. How can our audience learn more about you and what you're doing? For well, they can go to my website. Uh, kellycharlescollins.com all one word again that's kellycharlescollins.com and if you want to follow me on social media I encourage you to follow me on LinkedIn Kelly Charles Collins or on Twitter at HR Law Attorney Awesome Kelly this has been great everybody thank you so much for being here for this lunch and learn have a wonderful rest of your day see ya